Good morning, everybody. Just take your seats with you just for a moment. In fact, why don't you turn around, welcome somebody, say hello. Tell them they're loved, tell them they're blessed. Fantastic. Okay, that's enough. Come on, this is church. <laughs> uh, Book of Ephesians, chapter 5. I'm, I'm going to be uh, sh- just sharing a couple of verses from chapter 6 later, but uh, Ephesians 5 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, today, we thank you. We thank you, God, that your word tells us to sing, to sing and make music in our hearts. Lord God, today, we pray that as we worship you, it won't just be words, it won't just be music. The Lord, our Holy, our Spirit will connect with your Holy Spirit. The Lord, you would reach down from heaven. You would set us ablaze, Lord God. You would lift us up into those incredible heavenly places, Lord, that we may experience something of you. We may experience something of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, whatever we've brought with us into this place, Lord, whatever whatever baggage, whatever uh, luggage we've brought with us this week into this place, we ask, Father, right now, that we can, we place that down at the cross, Lord. We leave it with you. And Lord, we choose, we choose, let's stand together, church. Lord, we choose to step, we choose to step into your path today. We choose to follow you. We choose to lift up your name. We choose to worship you. We choose to declare your name. We choose to declare Jesus. We choose to say you are holy. We choose to say you are worthy. We choose to say we are forgiven under you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you that we can come into your house to worship you, Lord. We thank you that you're an awesome and an almighty God, and there's nothing that you cannot do. And Lord, we just stand here before you this morning and just declare that you are God, that you are Lord above all. And we sing your praises this morning, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we do, we do declare that today. Lord, we live that today. There is nothing better than you. There is nothing in our lives, Lord, that, we, that can even compare to you. There's nothing that comes close to you, Lord. There's nothing that, 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 that even comes close to your shadow, Lord. You are everything that we need in our lives. You are every sustenance. You are every provision. Lord, from, it, it, it's from you that we draw. You're the well which we draw from. You're the manner which sustains us. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just take your seats, would you, just for a couple of minutes. Um, just got a couple of notices for you today. Now, I'm very aware that... Um, is, is Riet here? Riet's not here, is she? I'm looking around. Riet, if you're here, wave at me. No. Um, and Brie isn't here this morning. I think Riet's uh, starting a new job today. And uh, Brie is not here. The family, they're away this weekend as well. Um, so it falls on me to announce the fun day, which we're having on the 3rd of August. And uh, so this is a joint venture between our missions team and our youth group, and uh, we're, we're putting on a fun day. Hopefully, we're praying for good weather. We're going to have a fun day out in the car park. We're going to have stalls and games, and we're going to do a barbecue, <coughs> all for the, for the community. We're getting the advertising out and all of that. We still need helpers. We need helpers to, uh, to, to man the stalls, and we need helpers for a cleanup crew afterwards as well. We've had uh, a couple of volunteers for the cleanup crew, but we could do with more. So that's people, you're obviously you're welcome to come to the fun day, but we want people who are dedicated to be able to come in and get the church back to uh, some semblance of normality for the, sun, the following Sunday morning. So uh, if you're willing to help with that, please do uh, give us a shout. Also, we need donations of uh, clothes, good, decent, clean clothes that we can... Um, that we can uh, uh, give out to the community on the day. So we need things like clothes, shoes, toys, uh, bric-a-brac, no, nothing uh, broken, falling apart. You know, please don't, it's, it's not a, uh, instead of going to the tip, you know, if something's ready for the tip, take it to the tip. Um, but we need some good stuff, some decent stuff. If it's something that you'd be pleased to receive yourself, then do bring it in and give it to that. We'd be really, really appreciative of that. Now, Karen's going to announce something about the worship night on Thursday. She's going to say, Leah, did you realize that that was you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> A long time ago. <laughs> anyway, um, you, you're all aware that we've, been to, we've done the Power Hour worship um, at the beginning of the year, which was a, just an hour on a Sunday night of, of worship uh, with no agenda. We haven't been able to do that for various reasons um, since the first couple of ones at the beginning of the year. Um, but as a team, as a worship team, we've, been, we've put aside our Thursday rehearsals for the time being. Um, we'll probably come back in the autumn. But we've put aside our Thursday rehearsals, and once a month we've been coming together just for power hour worship. And this month is our, is our next one, which is this Thursday. And I just want to open it up to other people, to anyone else that would like to come along. It's literally a a free room, a free room to do what you want with it, just worship, just pray, just, you don't have to be a musician, if you just love singing, if you just love worshipping, you can just come along, um, the mu we don't even, not all of us just get on the stage, we are literally just free, um, we have the music up on the screen and it's just an open place, so I just want to open that invitation out, the music group will be here but you're also welcome and if you want to come and meet the team and, you know, see who we are and get to know all of us in one go, then you're more than welcome as well. Thank you, Karen. Now, there's a young man here today, and uh, I'm going to bring him up, and, and we're going to pray for him in a moment. I've known this young man for, uh, I think, a couple of years now, and... Um, Three years. Sorry? Three years. Three years, is it? Three years. Wow, time flies. He's a remarkable young man. I've been impressed with Malachi since I first met him. I've been impressed with his... Um, come down here, Malachi. Come and, come and join me, mate. I've been impressed with Malachi's spiritual walk, with his connection with God. 
I've been impressed with his humility. I've been impressed with his heart for service. I've been impressed with his incredible work ethic. Malachi has a phenomenal work ethic. If you've been blessed enough as we have to have him come around and work in your garden, you'll know what I mean. I've never seen anybody who gets their head down and presses on in such an incredible way as Malachi. Malachi is leaving us today. It's his last Sunday with us for some time. He is realizing his dream of some years now, and he's joining the Royal Marines. And Malachi will be going I looked at Elaine. <laughs> I've got, this, is, this is a good thing. So Malachi will be leaving us. He's joining the Royal Marines. Uh, Malachi, when are you 17? 1st of October. 1st of October. So, so he's still just 16 years old, and he's going off and joining the Royal Marines. And we are incredibly blessed to have Malachi as part of this fellowship He's no less a part of this fellowship because he won't be here. I know that we're going to commit to continue to praying for him, especially through the period of his basic training. Would you just tell us what's happening over the next few weeks, Malachi? Um, So the first month is, they call it ROP. So the 32 weeks of training is broken down into five stages, and the first one is a month. Um, So I will be back in August for summer leave. Um, But the first month is... um, what does ROP stand for? Recruit orientation phase. So it's basically just breaking you in slowly to the rest of the training. Excellent. What sort of things will you be doing on your training? Do you know? Nah, it's all just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing it. <laughs> okay, we're going to pray for Malachi, and I just want to invite his family out, Abigail, Pete, and the boys, if you could all come out, and Simon as well. Malachi has been such an incredibly valuable, well, they all have, uh, but we're focusing on Malachi, and uh, such an incredibly uh, valuable part of our music team and part of our youth group. And so uh, I'll be a blubbering mess. I'm going to ask Simon to pray today. Thanks, Simon. Would you, can can we just stand to pray for the family today? And I'm going to be better. Um, Right. Malachi, we just uh, lift you up right now. Dear God, I just pray for Malachi as he makes this, uh, makes this adventure, this new chapter, Lord Jesus, in his life. And I just pray that as he goes, may you bless him, may you be with him. Protect him, Lord, from injury. Protect um, his mind uh, from the stuff that is going on, Lord Jesus. And let him still be true to who he is in you, Lord Jesus. And I just pray for the family as well. As they hear him saying, oh, he's done this this day or done that that day, Lord Jesus, that, uh, just give them comfort to know that, um, that you're there with him, Lord Jesus. And I just pray for protection over them all. In your mighty name, amen. Malachi, I just want to give you two, uh, not verses, but two passages of scripture today. And I was praying over these yesterday as I was putting these together. So these are not passages that I've just randomly selected. I really feel that these are for you. Psalm 31, verses 14 to 16. I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine upon your servant and save me from your unfailing love. And Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, and powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
And with this in mind, be alert and keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. And for the family, I have these verses for you as Malachi is away with his training. Psalm 56, verse 3. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose words I praise. In God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And John 14, 27, the words of Jesus. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I know Simon's prayed for Malachi. I want to pray for the family today. Lord, I thank you for Pete, for Abigail. Lord, for the boys. Lord, for Ethan and Jonah, we thank you for them. And Lord, as they uh, are at home, as they go about their everyday lives, Lord God, I know that there'll be, a, there'll, there'll be a space, there'll be a gap in their house. And Lord, every time they look at that empty chair at the table, every time they see the empty place in the bed, Lord, I pray, God, that their hearts will turn to Malachi and their hearts will turn to you. Lord, I pray, Father, that, uh, that they will know what it is to trust in you, to hold on to you, Lord God. And Father, as their son goes off and serves you in serving this country, then Lord, we pray that you will bless this family beyond all measure. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give them a round of applause, everybody. We're going to take up the uh, offering as we continue in our worship this morning. If you're a guest or a visitor with us, please don't feel under any obligation. A couple of our young guys are coming around now with the basket, so thank you for that.
cry out to you this morning. We just lift our hallelujahs. And Lord, we just ask that you just take those hallelujahs. Lord, that you just take us as we are this morning, where we are standing right now, Lord. You know every intricate detail of us, Lord. You know everything that's going through our minds. You know everything that's in our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that you take us and Lord, use us in this situation right now. Lord, minister to us. Speak to us. Let us be open to your spirit, Father. And Lord, spirit, pour out in this place. Lord, we just invite you right now to just pour out and speak to us, Jesus. Don't be afraid just to raise your hand, just to pray to him, just to sing out to him. And whatever the Spirit is prompting you to do, just take note and just listen. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Lord Jesus, we just give you praise. Lord Jesus, we lift our praises to you.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. an angle. There we go. How are we all? All right. A bit quiet. I'm a bit deaf in my left ear this week. I, I had an infection. I think it blew the drum. So, um, so, yeah. so apparently it takes about two to three weeks to heal. And if it doesn't do that, I'll have to go to the doctors. So God forbid. I hate going to the doctors. <laughs> you know, I know I am one, but I, I do loathe going to the doctors. Anybody else like me? You don't like dentists? You don't like doctors? It's like yeah, I call it Black Knight Syndrome, which is, if any of you have seen the Monty Python episode, where <laughs> it's just a flesh wound, um, it, that's me. Like, you know, it could be hanging on, it's just a flesh wound, it'll heal, it'll sort itself out. Um, and so, yeah, so if you see me touching my left ear, so I've gotten to the habit of it recently, um, so, um, so do excuse me. And if you kind of shout out on this side, I'm sorry, you know, the Lord will have to hear you because I can't, but you're all right. So, um, so we're all good. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you um, for this time this morning to come around your word together and to focus on you and one another and our duty before you to serve you and to love you and to follow you. And Lord, in this time that we've got this morning, I pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts and that, Lord, from the words of Paul, may you speak to us. Amen. Um, We're going through the book of Philippians. Um, Philip founded Philippi, um, and that's that's the reason for the name, which is which is great, really. Father of Alexander the Great, Um, and so this is the context of the the history of the of the time. We're going back two thousand years, and um, the book of Philippians is written about sixty two A.D. So right smack in the time just after um, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the early church. And Philippi is the first church founded in Europe. So um, remarkable that the whole of Europe now is effectively Christianized. And it all began with the first church in Europe in Philippi, which is really quite, I I find that quite humbling. Um, Spurgeon once said that faith is the capacity to see the forest in the cup of an acorn. And here we're looking at an acorn. And if you go around Europe now, you can see testimony to the work of Christians for 2,000 years, generation after generation. The founding of colleges and universities and hospitals and schools and music halls and libraries and theatres, all originally founded in the name of Jesus. Tottenham Hotspur, any Tottenham fans? Half Half the Premier League football teams were founded by Christians. And they founded them because they wanted to give the young men something to do with their energies, which wasn't destructive. And in the midst of it, take the opportunity to talk about character and discipleship. Isn't that amazing? I take a step back from that, and I just look at this chapters in this, in this book, written by Paul, and look at the effect of that mission in Philippi, and how that has transformed what we know as the Western world. And we owe our presence here today to the life and work of people like Paul, 2,000 years ago. Who wrote this book from prison? In Rome, in irons probably, he talks about his chains, writing this book to a group of followers who were in a place in Philippi where they were persecuted themselves. And they could have been easily discouraged by the circumstances and by the difficulties they were having around them. But Paul took the time to write to them. And, and we read it from the first chapter, they took the time to send resources to Paul to try and help him. So we have a small gaggle of people who love and serve Jesus Christ in an environment surrounded by people 
that did not believe in Jesus, did not believe that he rose again from the dead, would make open mockery of Jesus. And in, in, a, in a season where the government system itself had de deified its own ruler. And here we have this book, written by Paul. And I love the way it starts, grace and peace to you. Paul's in prison, in chains. Grace is the provision of God. Paul is in prison and in chains, unable to share the gospel with any more than those around him. Grace to you. How many of us don't always feel like we're surrounded by the grace of God? Like, even this last year, right? Think of circumstances that have gone on in your lives this last year. How many times have you got upset with God? Or out of your heart has come, God, sort this out. Like, sort my ear out, God. Like, sort, sort them out. Sort that circumstance. Sort my boss out. Sort the, the, the government out. Uh, sort, <laughs> sort it out, God. Grace and peace to you. Peace. The peace, he writes later, that passes understanding. Grace and peace to you. Peace, it's all going to be all right. But God, don't you realize what's going on in parts of the world and the threat it could be to us? It's all going to be okay. God, don't you realize the challenges there are in my own life and how things aren't working out and people around me are, are dropping like flies or, or, or somebody's having a crisis or, or the money's running out? Peace to you. It's all going to be okay. I have not forgotten you. grace and peace. The provision of our loving Heavenly Father be yours. The peace of God that passes understanding be yours. Grace and peace to you. So he writes, and I'm going to pick it up from verse 12. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress. I'm going to, instead of saying the word gospel there, because it means so many things to so many people, I'm going to use the Greek and just say good news. Is that all right? I don't want to offend too many people, but that's what it is. Progress of the good news, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy or strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything but that with all boldness Christ will, even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. I'm going to pause there, move to the verse that Malcolm loves in a moment. Um, that Christ would be exalted in my body, in life or in death. What does it mean for Christ to be exalted in your body? We have a framework of exaltation, which is usually based around music, but that's not what Paul is referring to. Paul writes in Romans 12, be living sacrifices, which is your spiritual act of worship. What does it mean to be exalted in your body? Now, if I was to come dressed today in Van Halen t-shirt, and, you know, have, have walked up to the front with, you know, a Van Halen song. I don't even know any Van Halen songs, but um, a Van Halen song. Van Halen would be exalted in my clothing. 
Van Halen would be exalted in my entrance. You would think he must be a fan of Van Halen. Not, but he, you must think that, right? I, and so, and, and I picked that because it's just random, but I also picked that because what we see when people buy tickets to go and hear Taylor Swift, or what we see when people wear the badge of the party, or what we see when people fly the flag in the game, is people exalting the object of their affection in their actions. Now, when you're wearing a badge or when you're flying a flag, it's a little bit like when we're singing in church and somebody's waving the flags around. They're exalting in their actions. But Paul is in chains. House arrest in Rome, Praetorian guards. And he says, whether by life or by death, that Christ be exalted in my body. And what he means by that is not that worship is something like a flag that he's flying or a t-shirt he wears or the music he comes into, but worship is someone he is rather than a time or a place of action. In other words, worship makes him distinctive at all times, in all places, by who he is. What is it about this person that is different? Maybe put it another way, there's a verse in the Bible that says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope within you. Well, the reason you need to be ready to give a reason for the hope within you is not because you've been armed with apologetics and arguments for God, but because people are going to come at you and say, why are you hopeful? Because otherwise, there's no reason to give a reason for the hope within you. But there's always hope, grace and peace be with you. Always be ready for the hope within you. Jesus, um, in uh, the, the, the book of Luke, chapter 19, you read the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He has been um, excommunicated, really, by the Jewish people for who he is. Um, as a consequence, as um, an excommunicated Jew, he's not allowed to sit at the table and eat with any Jewish people. He's certainly not allowed to go to any Jewish person's house to eat and not allowed to invite them to his house. And Jesus is walking along and Zacchaeus wants to get an understanding of who this Jesus is. He's heard about Jesus. He's heard that he's different. He's heard that there's something unique about this Jesus. And so he goes ahead of where Jesus is walking to, climbs a tree so he won't be in anybody's way, is trying to be a little bit incognito, which is probably easier if he'd have stayed on the ground, but there we go. And, um, and Jesus is walking along, stops at the base of the sycamore tree and looks up and there's Zacchaeus and he calls Zacchaeus down and says, I'm going to come to your house to eat today. That is not what you do. If you're religious and you're upstanding as a person and you realize the daylight robbery this man is making, exploiting people around him and becoming rich and fat of the poor, you would never go to his house to eat, let alone be associated with his name. And yet Jesus stops at the, at the bottom of the sycamore tree, looks up at Zacchaeus and says, I'm coming to your house today for food. He re-communicated somebody who had been excommunicated. In other words, Jesus stopped for the rejected, the most rejected, the most maligned, the most sidelined, the most rejected of rejects. Jesus stopped for him. He stopped to eat with a tax collector, not the poor. Not the leper today. He's eating with the tax collector. There's something different about Jesus in his behavior. Another story, Luke 7, you'll read the story of the woman with the alabaster jar. You'll all know it very, very well. But what happens is Jesus is eating at a Pharisee's house. A Pharisee is a teacher of the law. They were the it boys of the culture. They were the people you looked up to as the preachers of the day. They were the famous religious leaders of the time that were revered, listened to, and everybody had the podcast. In fact, other preachers probably preached the things they were preaching because they were so inspired by the transformation of, of, of the law into everyday life and the way that they brought this about. And so Jesus is at a Pharisee's house. You would expect a famous religious leader of the day to be at a Pharisee's house. 
because that's where you go. And then in walks a woman who is a reject in the culture. She walks through the, the, the dining area. People start to look up and are shocked by who's walked into a Pharisee's house. Everybody's going to have to go wash this woman so filthy spiritually, let alone physically. And she walks in, she gets down on her knees, and she begins to bathe and weep over the feet of Jesus. And the Pharisees turn around and said, if this man knew who was touching him, he's different. He sticks out like a sore thumb. He is willing to hang out with the most rejected rich person, and he's willing to hang out with the most rejected poor person. He's willing to sit with the most broken, and he's also willing to sit with the most rejected of hierarchy and systems. He's willing to sit down with Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. And being known to have dinner with them, who does he think he is? He will walk through the walls of the abortion clinic and sit and have dinner with the doctors. It's different. This Jesus meets with a man called Paul as he's on the road to Damascus to persecute a cult. Paul believes that this Jewish cult that believes in this man called Jesus who has contradicted what they believe is correct interpretation of the law, who has violated their regulations and their rules and their cultural values, who sits and eats with tax collectors and lets prostitutes wash their feet, who is known as a friend of sinners, this man who supposedly rose again from the dead, and he wants to put a stop to this. And so Paul, a zealot for God, believing strongly in the then written word and Bible, and able to interpret it from a very young age and having done everything right according to the law, is on his way to put a stop to this cult. And Jesus meets him on the road. Blinds the guy sideswiped by God. Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, from that moment, was radically transformed. Was called, Paul suddenly realized, I'm Zacchaeus. I was getting rich off the poor in spirit. I was using authority and power to oppress those who God was working through and doing things through. Paul realized that he was the woman at the feet of Jesus making the decision to crack the alabaster jar of his previous life over the feet and learn again what it was. Jesus turned around to the Pharisees in that moment and he'd said to them, those that have been forgiven much love much. And so Paul went from a theory, theological powerhouse, and I mean powerhouse, even to this day people talk about this man's mind. There's a book called by Anthony Flew, the famous atheist, on why he is now a Christian, and he puts it down to two things, the person of Jesus Christ and the intellect of Paul. And Paul, this powerhouse of mind, is humbled by this encounter with Jesus Christ, and he talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15, that he appeared to me, one, as if born outside of time. And Paul's life radically turns around. He goes from a man who takes power and knowledge and experience and wisdom from theology, and he turns into a man that writes a book like Philippians. Yes, we have Romans. Yes, we have this transforming series of, of thinking around what the gospel is, and that's why I said good news rather than gospel, because I don't want to jump through too many hoops this morning. But Paul starts talking about the good news, and we get to verse 21. This Paul, 
whose life has led to this moment, who is now in chains for the, for the good news of Jesus Christ, for the cause of Christ, this Paul writes, for me to live is Christ. He doesn't write, for me to live is to live like Christ. He doesn't write, for me to live is to live in Christ. He writes, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. These aren't one or the other. They are in pragmatic terms in this life. But the Christian faith details very clearly, when you step in to a following of Jesus Christ and a relationship with Jesus Christ and put your trust and your hope in him for your salvation, when you receive his grace and his peace, his kindness and forgiveness and his love for you, eternal life starts now, not when you die. Which means that the Christian faith is not about getting to heaven when you're dead, as I often describe it, like fire insurance. But the Christian faith is about life. To live is Christ. And what Paul is saying in this moment is that I've been so radically transformed by the love of Christ for me, by his work for me, by the gospel, by the good, full news of Christ and his life living in me. So radically transformed that for me, all of life is Christ. Whether in this life or the next, the next will just be a step of more fullness. But right now, to live is Christ. And therefore, in everything I do, and in everything I see, and in everywhere I go, and everywhere I breathe, I wish to glorify him and exalt him in my body, in my interactions. So when we're sitting in the business meeting, there's something different about them. When we're sitting at home with our children, there's something different about them. When we're sitting in the groups at school or with with pastors in the pastoral kind of meetings, there's something different about you. Because for you to live is Christ. Paul has given up so much, he's in chains. People are preaching the gospel. Some of them are trying to make him upset by saying, look how free we are. God's clearly best us and he's put you in jail. And all of those things are going on. And, and, And Paul is like, I don't care. Christ is preached. It's not about me. It's not about my pride. It's not about what I've built. It's not about my story. It's not about my legacy. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I've often said it. I'd, on my gravestone, I would like the words, he walked with the Lord and then was no more. <laughs> it's not about me. And I wish it wasn't about me so much more than it is. What, what Jesus is teaching us in the story of the alabaster jar, what Paul is teaching us in these words that he's writing to the Philippians and all the way through, and I don't want to rob from all the content that there is later in the book, is that the holiest thing, the holiest person, the greatest Christian is the one that loves the most and loves the least. The holiest thing is not the preacher. The holiest thing is not the stage. The closer you get to this spot here is, is not like holier. Like this square is the holy of holies. It has to be 10 by 10 by 10, right? The holiest thing is the mother that rocks the child to sleep. It is the nurse that holds the hand. It is the teacher that takes the time with the child that cries. It is the businessman that is reminded of the brokenness of those that are working for them and chooses to extend that extra hand of grace when grace is not warranted legally. Grace is given because it's the right thing to do. I was with a group of businessmen on Friday. One of them shared the story of how he'd got a new job And three weeks into his new job, he'd been diagnosed with cancer. So they let him go. Because he was just going to be off too much. And it damaged him badly. I won't tell you his name, but he shared it with a group of men. None of whom are Christian. 
and he shared about the trauma that had caused him. And to see that group of men decide they're going to wrap their arms around him and say, it's all right, mate, we're here for you. I often ask the question, where is God working? I think I've told this story before, but I love this story. And I told it recently in events, so I thought I'd share it here. I met a guy once at um, Hillsong in Switzerland, a war photographer. And he used to carry around um, his camera everywhere he went. And he, he, he'd gone around and taken photos of world leaders all over the world. And he, he had photographs of himself in Yasser Arafat. How cool is that, right? Like Idi Amin. Like, I mean, he's literally... And he had these photos of him with these world leaders. And what he'd done is, he'd, back in the days before selfies, you had to put things on timers. And so he'd put his camera on a timer and he'd go and stand with them. But what was interesting is every single photograph where he'd done his selfie with these world leaders, and some of them were, were tyrants and some of them were great world leaders. And it was just a whole selection. Every single photograph, he was carrying a little red car. I'm like, what was he in the car then? And he said, I've got a son and I don't know where he is. He said, I was well before the time of, as a Christian. He said, I was with a woman, and she had a child. And he was growing up, he was about three years old. And I was going away for about three weeks to do some photography in a war zone. And he gave me his little red car. He says, Daddy, look after the little red car. It means I'm with you, and I'll see you when I get back. And when he got back, his wife had left him, or his girlfriend had left him, with the son. And he doesn't know where they are. 13 something years. No contact before the days of social media. And so everywhere he went, he decided he was going to have his photograph taken with his little red car. So that if one day, if one day, the little boy grown up, all his life believing his dad might have abandoned him, if one day he gets a chance to meet his little boy, can show him every photo because his whole life he wanted his boy to know he was loved little red car Paul he's writing to the Philippians you can see how much he loves them Malcolm covered those verses last week thanks God with joy in remembrance of them carrying his little red car. And the rest of the book, we're going to be going through all sorts, and there's so many things I could cover this morning. But the, the key beginning point of the book is Paul is trying to communicate something. He peppers communicates all the way through the verses of his letters. You'll read it very clearly in Galatians 5, verse 6. Paul is trying to communicate that the very essence of faith is a life lived loving like Christ. That the greatest act of worship that you can ever do is to love like him. Is to be carrying a little red car of the Father's love for every person you meet, for every heart you connect with, for every soul you touch. And it doesn't matter whether they are the greatest thing from since sliced bread in your eyes or whether they are an utter failure and a reject, or worse, are your enemy. Your little red car. Paul carried a little red car with the Praetorian Guard. The Roman soldiers who we spoke to, some of them would have crucified people, sharing the good news of Jesus and his love for them and the forgiveness that comes from God. And that they have a special place in his heart and he knows every hair on their head to every woman that was rejected, to every person that's overlooked, to every person that's judged, the love of God extended to you, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, be better if I was with Jesus. I'm in chains. Life's tough. But here I am, and for your sake, I will live like Christ. So while every breath I have, and for as long as I live, my hope and my dream would be that you see him in me, 
and get inspired to do the same. Whether you are a success or a failure, whether you feel like your life is a train wreck of a story and you wish for a new day, or whether you've lived your entire life of perfection, if only you see Christ and his love in me and that you get inspired to do the same. I sat down with somebody this week and I'm just closing now. I sat down with somebody this week and um, they were telling me we need a new religion. Why do we need a new religion? Because people need to learn to love one another again. I said, you mean we need an example of love that transcends all cultural boundaries? Yeah. Does that mean that we need an example of love that no matter how hard you try to kill it, it keeps coming back stronger and stronger and stronger? Yeah. Do you mean we need an example of love that's capable of breaking some of the toughest hearts in the world and turning them back towards their children and their families? Yeah. Do you mean we need the kind of love that causes people to forgive when they have no power to forgive in their soul? Yeah. I think we already have that in the person of Jesus Christ for the sake of the gospel so that Christ is preached. So my encouragement to you today as we are just coming around to sing is simply to do what Jesus has asked us to do which is to love one another and they will know him by our love for one another. To live like Christ. To carry the little red car of God's love wherever we are to whoever we meet. To not break down your Christian pr practice and your Christian worship to ceremonies and places and moments. But to let all of your life be filled with the love and light of God to let all of your breath be breathed with the love and light of God, that we would live Christ rather than simply believe in him and learn more about him. Chesterton said, it's not the bits in the Bible I don't understand that I found hard, it's the bits I do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for, you, for your love for us which breaks the back of cynicism. I thank you for your love for us that melts the heart of stone. I thank you for your love for us, which if we taste and see that you're good, our whole life becomes full of grace and peace. And Lord, in this season and time of hopelessness and despair and uncertainty and confusion, in a time where people's hearts are breaking, where money is running out, and where souls are searching for meaning, help us to be different. Help us to be like Christ. Help us to love. Help us to breathe you into this world. May we see a harvest not of a congregation, but of a culture that turns to you and finds life. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. All those people stand together, shall we, as we close our service?
in 1910, General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, was due to speak at a convention where thousands of Salvation Army delegates came together from across the world. Sadly, he was too ill to be able to attend the conference. His time was soon to draw to a close on this earth. And so they asked if he would pen a message to the delegates of the conference from across the globe, a message of hope, something incredible, something inspiring, something that, that, that they could give on his behalf, read out on his behalf. And so he put a message together and he sealed it. And at the start of the conference, it was opened and it simply said, others. That's it. Others. Father, today we thank you for this message on others. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus took the time for others. Lord, we thank you for stories such as Zacchaeus, such as the woman with the alabaster jar and so many others through Scripture that showed us that Jesus was interested in others, even with his own disciples, Lord. They were not the best of the best. They were just fishermen. And Lord, I thank you that we can draw hope from that. We can draw inspiration from that. And the Lord, we can live Christ and Lord, my prayer today is that each one of us lives Christ. The Lord, when people see us, they see you. When they hear us, they hear you. Lord, may every word from our mouths be measured with grace and peace. May every action be one of grace and peace. And Lord, may others come to know you. Not just through our words, but through our trials, through our actions, through everything that we go through in our lives, through the way we live Christ, and through the way we die as gain. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget the 3rd of August is our uh, fun day. Um, if you're able to volunteer for that, please do. Please see Karen, actually, and she'll pass your details on to uh, Brie and Riette. That would be amazing. Um, if some of our younger people could help stack up the chairs, that would be great as well, please. We've got um, the Treehouse Theatre Company using the church building.